Hello, everyone. This is Daryl Y. Hamamoto with Cultural Forensics. The date is August 6, year 2021. The time is 12.49 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I will be sharing with you today excerpts from a very important book. The title is The Molecular Invasion, and it is authored by a collective. I think it's an, an anarchist collective, and their name is Critical Art Ensemble. Their publishing wing is titled Autonomedia, and it says here, Anti-Copyright 2002, Autonomedia and Critical Art Ensemble. Now, this is not the only book that I have read by this collective. I found each one of these volumes highly provocative. This book in particular, titled The Molecular Invasion, is especially important in helping us to understand the malformation of our society, our culture, our political system, and even down to the molecular composition of our species being. This is the reason why I'm taking the time today to share with you what I believe to be a set of important insights in understanding our world. It's up to us to face this challenge, and I think we're up to it, don't you? In the first chapter, there's a section titled The Fourth Domain, and this is where the authors of this incredible book propose a fourth category in addition to the three standard categories employed by the natural sciences. The authors call this the fourth domain, and there is a subsection titled as such. Here's an excerpt right from the book. If popular yet significant biological classification systems, such as animal and vegetable, are forgotten for the moment, and one instead examines the classifications used by specialists in biology, we find a general system of three domains. This scheme is relatively new and is based in molecular studies that reveal the existence of a small group of organisms now known as archibacteria. Formerly, these organisms were placed in the kingdom Monera, a classification reserved solely for bacteria, because they appear to be just another form of bacteria. However, since it has been recently discovered that these organisms have significant differences from bacteria in the composition of their 16s, R RNA sequences, cell walls, plasma membranes, and other key molecular features, many scientists now believe that they should have their own unique classification. Furthermore, in terms of evolutionary distance from bacteria and eucrocytes, archibacteria seem to require a domain of their own. Some biologists believe that the traditional general classification system of the five kingdoms, which is primarily based on morphology, is no longer suitable, given recent developments in molecular biology, and they now favor the domain classification system. Following this trend, and for the purposes of this essay, Critical Art Ensemble will also use the domain system. Bacteria are in the domain bacteria, archaebacteria are in the domain archaea, and eukaryotes are in the domain eukarya. And here's the kicker, ladies and gentlemen. Listen carefully. However, since DNA from these domains is now transversal, given new breakthroughs in transgenic practices, it seems that the time is right to suggest the creation of a fourth domain, transgena. This domain would be reserved for organisms that were manufactured by mixing genomes or parts thereof from the three domains in a manner different from species emergence through evolutionary process. Whether mixing genomic elements from the various domains, along with mixing genomic elements from different species of the same domain, will have the effect of creating creatures with significant enough differences to warrant such a radical classification is open to speculation. However, if molecular difference and evolutionary distance can give rise to such considerations, it would seem that radical intervention into the evolutionary process, both in terms of selection and velocity, and into genomic construction could make such a reclassification necessary. 
It should also be noted that classification systems are in a constant state of flux because of the rapid leaps in knowledge that various biological specializations are making on a regular and immediate basis. What at first might seem premature can quickly become necessary. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, images of so-called gender fluidity and fantastic uh, representations of chimera, or a chimera as some people pronounce it, should be dancing through your head, like one of the panels in Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights, which we'll get to in a moment. Reading further. In the end, however, Critical Art Ensemble is more than willing to leave biological classification systems to the specialists. At the same time, however, scientists must realize that no semiotic system is pure. Even scientific systems are affected by the recombinant nature of language. Social, political, and economic meanings all inform any textual configuration. While the fourth domain, from the point of view of the specialized position of molecular biology, may currently fall somewhere between the nonsensical and the speculative at best, it still represents a significant series of social, political, and economic separations. The appearance of the organisms conceived within an ideological matrix of categorical mixing and removed from the evolutionary chain via the process of manufacture will have profound effects on biological sign and exchange value, will alter the construction of Western cosmologies, and will dramatically affect the development of industries of applied biology and the general technological apparatus of all fields of communication and research. Perhaps the fourth domain will only function as a socio-political interpretive model, but even if this turns out to be the case, it will be compelling nonetheless. The next section, ladies and gentlemen, is titled The Mythology of the Fourth Domain. While the material appearance of the fourth domain has coincided with giddy euphoria among many biological specialists, industry leaders, and those willing to swiftly embrace new scientific and technological developments, its traditional mythic place has not been one of such positive associations. This domain was among the unnameable, either in its purity as the domain of the power of gods, or in its profanity as unthinkable taboo in the realm of humans. This latter possibility is what defined its tendency for people in the West, thus establishing it as one key site associated with the ideology of fear. The fourth domain was the category of the monstrous, a location where mixing categories by humans conjured the sinful, the perverse, the horrific, and thus offended God and or nature. For those who were willing to do what ought not be done, punishment was swift and harsh, coming from both secular and metaphysical forces. Entering the fourth domain was the ultimate challenge to the authority of order and all its institutional manifestations. One need only look back to foundational mythic texts, in the broadest sense of the term, of the Western world to see that hybridity was a concept stratified in accordance with social relations. A central text for issues of transformation, synthesis, and recombination is Ovid's Metamorphosis. This work is a full compendium of becomings that reveal the rules of who has the power and ability to rearrange the natural order and explains the consequences of such arrangements. Ovid offers two key rules about interventions in the natural order. The first is that creation, invention, and movement beyond the flow of the Logos is limited to the will of the gods. The second is that such activity among humans, when not guided by the hands of the gods, will end in disaster. Punishment for such transgressions is contained within the process of recombination. Appropriating the power of the gods, 
whether manifesting as either a spiritual entity or as a natural force, will only speed a mortal's confrontation with death. The harshest penalty is always issued for such excessive appropriations and is quickly delivered without remorse or pity. A better-known myth in Ovid's volume is the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Held prisoner on Crete, Daedalus bemoans his fate and his inability to escape by sea routes that are well controlled by Cretan forces. However, he notices that the heavens are an open field that is not under the control of any king. He then devises a scheme to create wings that will allow him and his son to fly off the island and back to their homeland. He successfully transforms himself into a recombinant creature by appropriating some of the forms of a bird. Daedalus and his son fly from the island. However, Icarus, being young and impetuous, does not follow his father's advice of staying the middle course, a quick lesson in Aristotelian ethics, and pushes the limits of his recombinatory nature by flying too high. The wax that holds the feathers in his wings melts due to the heat of the sun, releasing the feathers into the air, and Icarus falls from the sky, landing in the ocean where he drowns. This myth focuses on what occurs when humans attempt to appropriate the space and skills of the gods. Rearranging the natural order is a fatal art that ends in accursed consequences. Eventually, such practices will be renamed the Black Arts, but they remain just as fatal. Daedalus's crime is clear. He turned his thinking toward unknown arts, changing the laws of nature. He transgresses the limits of human agency and ability and pays an exceptional price in the death of his son. Much of the story also describes commoners, fishermen, farmers, and shepherds, who see the two flying overhead. They are content with their sphere of influence and perceive those who challenge the sky as necessarily being gods. Separation and law are intimately linked, and neither must be transgressed for any reason. As shall be shown, this story resonates through time well into the industrial period, and onward into the post-industrial period, with our current fears and concerns over transgenics. Mythologies like the above do not fade away after the Greco-Roman period, but instead continue to harden in their expression. The little flexibility afforded humankind in Greco-Roman myth is tightened all the more in the Christian paradigm. The chain of being was a fearsome catalog of separations that put a clear limitation on when and how what could mingle with what. Only now, the intensity of horror has increased. The monstrous became cruel, grotesque, and ever-present. Constant temptations to transgress the natural order became a part of the human burden, and monsters and demons born of human failure, folly, and lack walked the earth. Further, the polarities between good and evil with regard to categorical mixing became less ambiguous. The kingdom of God was perfect. Unlike in the world of pagan gods, no monsters of the earth were spawned by conflicts in heaven. The recombinant beings of heaven were always delightful. For example, angels could have wings, for unlike Daedalus and Icarus, they were designed by God to be part of the heavens. Flight was a natural part of their domain. On the other hand, demonic creatures were recombinant as part of their fight against the natural and spiritual order. They were manifestations of perversity and evil, where the most repulsive and dangerous physical characteristics of the earthly domain were mingled together in a manner that reflected an inner being of defiance and disobedience. The paintings of Hieronymus Bosch are excellent visual texts, revealing the continuance of the association of fear, monstrosity, and death in the fourth domain. 
Bosch illustrates the shifting and differing elements between pagan and Christian ideas about the nature of the fourth domain. His paintings are filled with recombinant creatures that mingle with humanity, and he also represents the transformation of humans themselves into recombinant creatures because of their unrepentant transgressions. The variety of creatures representing various depravities in the form of recombination are too numerous to catalog in this essay. Throughout this work, and most notably in the Garden of Earthly Delights, the Hay Wayne, the Last Judgment, and the Temptation of St. Anthony, viewers get a smorgasbord of possible recombinations. The human form is combined with birds, with fish, with rats, and with plants, all of which are grotesque and frightening to behold. Bosch also populates his landscapes with human transformations. For example, the berry head, middle panel, bottom, center, right, in Garden of Earthly Delights, represents voracious carnality as a metaphoric catalyst. The phrase, to pluck fruit, a common vulgarity at the time for a sexual escapade, becomes the metaphor for the fate of a sinful mingler, the loss of humanity, and the reduction of status in the chain of being to that of a plant. In addition, Bosch catalogues numerous unnatural acts in the form of deviant intimacy between animals and humans. This may be read literally, as it seems quite probable that bestiality was on his list of perversions, but there are additional layers. The bird sodomizing a man with its beak in Garden of Earthly Delights indicates a concern for sodomy itself and the sinfulness of homosexuality in general. The pig in sexual embrace with a nun, Garden of Earthly Delights, is a reminder of similar sins, but is also a charge against the decadence of the church and its fall from the natural order. Bosch's images, much like so many representations of earthly recombinancy that sprang from the medieval imagination, are visions of horror and the monstrous that have considerable currency in the present. The model has not changed, not in Gothic horror of the 19th century, nor in the present flights of horrific fantasy that Hollywood presents. Perhaps Hollywood has increased the intensity of the image by increasingly presenting explicit depictions of the codes of the monstrous, but the codes themselves are quite stable. Beginning with Gothic tales of Frankenstein, the change that occurs is that the recombinant becomes secularized. The natural order is not part of the intention of God. The delightful and the monstrous are just an emergent part of nature itself. Science as a Daedalian intervention can help improve the human relationship with the natural order. However, it must stay within the fairly traditional sphere of human intervention. This means that encroachment upon the fourth domain, the domain of hybridity through recombination, should be off limits. When this boundary is crossed, the monstrous appears, and it is usually to the mortal detriment of the one who conjured it. Traces of both pagan and Christian wisdom continue to appear in the notion that transcendent forces, which will bring doom if disturbed, should be left alone. David Cronenberg's remake of The Fly demonstrates the power and longevity of the representation of the monstrous as recombinant, its new grounding in the secular, and the persistence of the belief that certain creative boundaries should not be crossed. Here, a scientist hoping to make the greatest breakthrough in transportation history begins to fiddle with the idea of teleportation. An investigation into increasing transport velocity is acceptable, and this is not his transgression. The problem begins when he wants to teleport flesh, rather than limiting himself to inanimate objects. However, his computer is unable to reintegrate living tissue. This is the point where he crosses the boundaries of creation. He programs his computer to be imaginative in the manner in which it reassembles molecules of the flesh. When a fly is caught in the teleportation chamber with him, rather than reintegrating the two as separate entities, the computer combines them so that they might mingle and improve at the molecular level. 
At first, this synthesis has positive effects, but as time goes on and the less desirable traits of the fly begin to assert themselves, the character Seth Brundle becomes increasingly monstrous until he can no longer be part of the natural or the social order. The moral, in this case, is that messing with time-space for the purpose of transporting objects is fine, since that is within the confines of human agency, but insinuating oneself into the integration of flesh is unacceptable, and carries with it its own harsh punishment. No character in the film is afraid of teleportation. In fact, most are thrilled by it. Rather, the molecular reconstruction of the flesh is what causes fear and skepticism among them. This concern is later amplified by the fact that Brundle's transgression affects his reproductive system, ending in the passing off of his monstrous becoming, a genomic time bomb that removes the stability of species boundaries on to another generation. The curse of the fly has a germline effect and that element provides the narrative for the fly, too. Thank you for staying with me, ladies and gentlemen. The authors of this provocative essay conclude in the following manner. While this data may only be impressionistic, the countless examples of the interconnections between recombinancy, the monstrous, and the ideology of fear are too numerous to ignore. These inescapable traditional ideological structures are internalized by individuals within Western cultures and send waves of panic wherever they are made manifest. Hence, capital must contend with the non-rational fears that often accompany biotechnological initiatives that explore recombination in the form of the transgenic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the reading for today, and I'll be back with you very soon. Until then, this is Professor Hamamoto for Cultural Forensics.